We will go through a, a panel discussion regarding research libraries in the 2020 information landscape. Why did we decide to propose such a, a, a panel? Um, because, um, as you heard, um, Europe is making a very huge effort uh, trying to implement uh, a, a, something like 80 billion euros research and innovation program until 2014 to 2020. So we thought in Lille that it would be a good opportunity to see how research libraries will evolve from now to 2020 in a rapidly transforming information context. Um, to tackle that big issue, we gathered um, five panelists. First one is Mrs. Rachel Frick from uh, Council on Library and Information Resources. She's the director of the Digital Library Federation program. That's it. Um, we also have on the other side of the table Dr. Cliff Lynch, who is director from CNI, Coalition for Networked Information, um, structure sponsored by ARL and EDUCOS. Uh, next to him, we have Professor Hulf Goranson, who is the chairman of CERL. Uh, he has been formerly director of the Uppsala University Library and member of the Labour Board, so you know him very well, I guess. Uh, next to him, uh, Mr. Budger, president of EBLIDA. Uh, you know, I guess you all know Embrida, which, uh, which is the, an umbrella for association and institution in Europe. And next to him, our last panelist, Dr. Elliot Shaw, who is director of IRL, Association of Research Library US and, and Canada. So um, to try to make it vivid, I ask them not to give any PowerPoints, of course, but uh, we decided together to go through five five minutes visions on five specific topics we discussed together, and then start a, a, a panel discussion among, uh, among the, the, the speakers. So um, we will talk about strategy, we'll talk about collections, about people, about lobbying, and about networking. And uh, everyone has kindly accepted to comment on uh, one of these topics uh, in, a, in, a, in a very short time. So the first speaker would be Elliot Shaw, and he will say a little words about implementing the IRL system of action uh, for the future from the US libraries. Thank you, Julian. So I have five minutes. I want to talk about five things, one minute on each one. First one is the framework that we had for making change. We worked with two people you might know, John Seely Brown and Ann Pendleton Julian. And um, John told us the challenges we face are fundamental and substantial. We've moved from um, an era of equilibrium to a new normal, an era of constant disequilibrium. And our ways of working and creating value and ways of innovating have to be reframed. So what we did is that we tried, we didn't go for Horizon 2020, we went for Horizon 2033. We were trying to imagine a world that we would create, not a world that we would change from what it is now to what it will become tomorrow. In other words, we were trying to make the argument that we create our own future, that the future isn't thrust on us, it isn't a series of uh, decisions we have to make um, based on the reality that we're living in now, although we did not discount the reality where we're living in. So we looked at every strategic plan of every 125 member libraries of ARL and all of the university strategic plans. One of the problems we think we see in the library world is a navel gazing. Uh, we, we look internally, we don't look externally. We think we can find all of the answers ourselves. So we were making an argument that that's not possible. And I see how beautifully um, Lieber has done that with um, working with the AU, working with governments, working with universities. We were trying to do something similar at ARL. And what we decided then was that ARL would move away from its traditional roles in the sense that it would start to facilitate, scaffold, structure, or support new developments. It might work towards shaping, designing, and influencing, and even building 
new coalitions or new infrastructure, which might, and it might manage, run, or spin them off. So we think that ARL's new roles will be that it will inspire, broker, mediate, that it will facilitate, shape, and build, and potentially manage new collective programs. So what we're looking to do, of course, is to do that with a number of partners, including, hopefully, with Lieber. So we uh, developed a, a, um, a, a strategy that had us meet with more than 400 people around the U.S. and Canada in 10 regional meetings. We then took all of the ideas to um, a group, a, what we call design studios. Our main consultant is an architect and designer, and I would recommend her to you. She has the kind of capacious brain that can put together an enormous amount of information and start to structure it. And so uh, what we came up with provisionally, and everything we are doing, we are imagining is provisional, is what's called a system of action. And a system of action, the notion here is that everything we would do would affect the ecosystem that we live in and that they are all interconnected. So I'm going to mention six things quickly and then focus on two of them, and I think I'll be done with my five minutes. Um, the, the six are coordinated management of collective collections, scholarly publishing at scale, something called the ARL Academy, building a boundless symposium, a first suite of smart libraries, and an innovation lab and venture capital fund. And the two things that we are already starting to work on are the ARL Academy and the Information and the Innovation Lab. We also find that these notions are actually interconnected. The notion behind the ARL Academy, and I think my colleague Rachel Frick will talk a little bit more about this later, we are not sure we have the right folks for the right positions, and we're not sure when we have the right folks for the right positions that they are um, in a position to succeed. So the ARL Academy is an attempt to bring together leadership programs, management programs, and notions of pop-up um, centers for research that might last for a few years and then go away, and that ARL would play the role of pulling those together. The Innovation Lab is deeply connected to that, and the idea is here that ARL might look like a skunk works or might look like a place that puts together three or four partners to try to figure out what is the best way, what are the best visualization strategies and visualization labs, who does that well, and how we can do, that, do this together. And then let me just finish with saying the problems we think we see cannot any longer be solved by any of us individually no matter how uh, well our libraries are managed and no matter how much money you have. Um, and libraries are banding, to, banding together by themselves is not a sufficient strategy. Without partners within the universities, not to mention other educational associations, governmental and commercial entities, we won't succeed. So our associations need to play an active and vigorous role in partnering. Thanks a lot. I would like the panelists maybe to, to comment on that and, and especially with maybe a first question to, to launch discussion. It would be, do you think, because I, I had a, a deeper look at what you, you, you are doing in AOL and it's quite impressive to see uh, the number of discussion you, you have and, and, and the building of such a strategic plan and so on. So do you think, do you all, do all the chairmen and, and, and leaders of uh, association think that in every association to prepare the future we should discuss that uh, as deeply as uh, Ariel did and, and maybe after that formalize something to, to, to have clear directions and, and many priorities in, uh, in what we will do for tomorrow. Uh, I think that uh, I, I'm, I'm really struck by how much convergence there is, at least among our colleagues in the United States, about their assessment of the situation today. Um, uh, I think it's quite striking, and we've been having um, conversations among diverse groups that include the um, 
top leadership, the presidents and chancellors of um, major universities, uh, the leadership in the library community, and the leadership in the information technology and networking community, that all seem to be coming to the conclusion we need a very different level of collaboration and coordination uh, going forward. And um, uh, it, it, it's, I think that's very much reflected in what Elliot was describing. Do you want to comment more on, on that? Um, no, let's, let's let some other people have some. Okay, so maybe you can move to topic number two because I think that something will, cro will be crossed from one topic to, to, to another. The, the, the second topic we would like to, to comment during the, the panel discussion, it's about collections because we work in libraries and libraries are also about collections even in a, in a digital time. So uh, I would like to hold the ransom to, to give a few speech regarding that topic in Horizon 2020. Thank you. Uh, and uh, I would like to say a few words on new research possibilities in special collections. And uh, this is, of course, on, on behalf of CERL, uh, the consortium, consortium of of, of uh, European research libraries who is focusing on the old material and the unique material in our collections. Uh, and the two uh, uh, objects uh, that I would like to, to stress on are not new at all, but uh, they can be used in new forms, and that is digitization and cataloging. Sounds very old fashioned, at least cataloging, but I'll come back to that. And what digitization can, can do, we all know, but it's not only to show objects uh, to the world at large that you don't have to travel to one uh, library, uh, from one library to another to see an object that you uh, are interested in uh, for your research, uh, but uh, only images are not enough. And we know that the uh, text operating and the OCRing uh, is going on, but uh, at, I think, a rather slow pace. Uh, because to, to uh, OCR an old print, uh, an incunable or 16th century print, is not easy for the machines available. And uh, the development there has to be, uh, to, to be uh, much more rapid than it is today in order for, for it to recognize uh, already the Latin uh, alphabets used by old printers. Uh, not to speak about uh, Arabic and, and other alphabets uh, all over the world, which are even more complicated. Uh, the search possibilities with an OCR uh, text is, of course, immense and huge, and, and uh, you can find new information there. Uh, I don't have to, uh, to, to uh, stress that even more. But uh, there are combinations to make if you have uh, numerous data files with texts uh, and uh, these possibilities already of recognition of what the text is about is uh, a new field for research in old material. And then we come to manuscripts, of course. There have been many efforts around the world and even in, in Sweden uh, to OCR manuscripts, but I have never heard of anyone that has been successful so far. Uh, and th that, is, that is very sad because of the many fragments that you have uh, in the libraries, some of them are not possible to, to understand what they are about because they are too small or too unknown. They are perhaps uh, a discovery of a lost text from the ancient times, but you don't know what it is. And uh, if you have this uh, in a much broader sense, then uh, in, a, in a broader and more detailed and more correctly ocr way, that will be a, an enormous advance for, for research in this material. But of course, OCRing can't uh, replace cataloging. If you have experts in your libraries who know what it is they are looking at, uh, and the new forms of cataloging uh, with new parts uh, bring us to, to, for example, provenance research, 
and uh, reshaping dispersed collections uh, if you have that possibility to, to really combine uh, the, the modern forms of cataloging of these details. And some parts uh, of extreme interest are of course marginal uh, comments in old prints, uh, especially if you know who made the comments, but even if you don't know that, they can give uh, much more information to the researchers. Uh, there are needs, of course, for platforms for this because you cannot just uh, sit in your own institution and, and digitize material and put it out there and hope that people will find them. Uh, that is uh, almost like just having them at home. And uh, this is uh, also a challenge uh, to index the material and have it uh, spread out and perhaps one should hope for Google to, to do a bit of work here because uh, we all know that most of our researchers, be they in, in science or in humanities, they, sadly enough, perhaps for a librarian, they start at Google anyway, however much you'd uh, like to, to, to teach them. So um, I think it's important uh, for, for us to know that uh, knowledge can be spread in uh, many different ways and through many different channels, but you have to start with qualified or, and quality and efficient uh, digitization and cataloging. Thank you. Does anyone want to comment on that? I, I, maybe I have a question connected to special collections because uh, when we talk about special collections we, also, we, we often have to talk about uh, uh, the combined activity of uh, research libraries with whole collections and national libraries. So at, uh, at, um, at an, an horizon of 2020 or 2030, what, what could be, what should be the evolution of, of the role of uh, uh, specialized uh, libraries and national libraries in such a context as you described? Well, I, I, I do not think that uh, uh, the national libraries have a very specific role in this. It can be so in, in many countries, but in other countries uh, they have, uh, like in Scandinavia, uh, a role of, of, of uh, combining and, and uh, also uh, try to, to network within the country. But I think in the European time that we live in uh, and, and with our organizations, here, I think that the national boundaries are of very little interest, actually, for the research in uh, uh, this historic aspects uh, of research in old material. Because you can find uh, uh, in the northernmost parts of Europe uh, material that wa was uh, uh, originally made and, and produced in southern Europe or in China or even in the Americas. So I can't see a difference between uh, the research libraries, the university libraries and uh, institute libraries and the national libraries here, but to, to have a cooperation and, and networking is of course of extreme importance. If I might just add one footnote to that. Uh, one of the most exciting developments that I'm seeing is we started by digitizing special collections very much on an institutional basis. They had the physical materials, they digitized them, they made them part of the local digital library or digital collections offerings. Now we're seeing a new phase where collections are being structured that are logically organized, um, moving away from the kind of historical accidents of where the physical material was stored into knowledge structures that are, I think, much more responsive to what the, what the scholars really want to do with the massive material that is spread all across our archives and libraries. And I think that's a very significant development, and we'll see a lot more building on that theme. <laughs> Yeah, I think a really good example of that is the Ramon de la Rose project coming out of Johns Hopkins in partnership with the BNF. 
I mean, it's a large manuscript collection. It's a place where our manuscripts that were spread all over the world are now available to anyone. And then what's amazing about that, or the next generation, that project, that program, is engaging scholars and data curators around medieval manuscripts and uh, medieval scholarship. But also on a technical level, they're um, you know, <coughs> developing the new type of viewer and type of annotation technology that can sit on top of platforms so scholars can go in and use the same viewer to look at different types of manuscripts that have been digitized using different types of standards on different types of uh, platforms, but the viewer remains the same. And that's another international project that's coming out of Stanford. So. Also, if I may, may, uh, if I may add, uh, that the cooperation between the, the, the libraries and the scholars who use the, their material is uh, much more profound now, and, and the results of their, their scholarship uh, can be immediately attached to, to the material uh, in the digital era. Thanks. Let's move to item number three, because uh, future of libraries, of course, about people. So I would like Russell Frick to, to stress on uh, staffing and training issues for the future. Great. I think um, just some of the comments, I'm going to keep my comments brief so we can have more time for discussion, um, really echo what Elliot had to say and um, uh, the previous speaker said. Um, I think it's this whole idea of reimagining what our libraries are and who works in our libraries and what do we mean when we call ourselves librarians. Is it somebody that has gone through a specific program or is it more of a professional class that we have uh, ascribed to the same values? And when we're thinking about our libraries as these creative um, spaces for building um, new knowledge, that requires maybe skills that aren't happening right now or creating those types of professionals that are coming through our library schools at the moment. Um, there has been significant investment made in our library schools around things around data management and data curation, but we really do not have the supply of that level of professional development to meet the demand that we're seeing in our research libraries. So what do we do in the meantime? Because the demand is there, right? So how do we retrain and, and skill our existing staff? But where do we go to find um, uh, folks to help us manage this current challenge around data management? And the organization I work for has been um, developing a program using um, postdocs, and we have a postdoctoral fellowship program specifically targeted at data management and data curation where we engage recently minted uh, PhDs and we uh, work with the education program and we um, work with our members to develop uh, opportunities for that researcher to bridge the gap between the discipline and the library and to talk about the research needs within their specific discipline. That is one alternate model for helping us with staffing. It's not the golden, you know, it's not the golden, um, fleece, it's not that top of the mountain, but it is a creative way. And what I'm seeing more of is people taking creative approaches and not going the more traditional routes, not always going to those same um, hiring pools and trying to think differently of the people that they bring into the library. Um, there's some, a lot of exciting things happening, and uh, it's, it's just important that we um, take a moment and try to maybe go to a different resource for that talent to come in. Um, it's a well-accepted notion that in order for innovation to happen, we have to have new ideas and new perspectives. If we keep hiring in the same ways, if we keep um, going to the same pools of talent, then um, our thinking won't change that dynamically. And if, um, Elliot, what Elliot was saying, if we could, had to imagine rebuilding our world instead of trying to adjust it. Um, bringing in those new perspectives are going to be really key. So I'm hoping that our libraries are a mix of professionals and not just one stripe. So. Okay, so uh, question to, a, to the other speaker. So um, we, we are here on, on the room all uh, either uh, library leaders at, at different levels, but we are library leaders. So, so what, what you, should a library leader focus on uh, in the coming years when he will recruit staff 
for, for the future, in your opinion? What is the, the main issue or the, main, the two main issues you will have in mind uh, when you will be recruiting some staff? There's so many issues, it's just like, ooh. Um, data is a big issue, and I, but I, I really, I, I don't want to pick a specific issue. I think it's more important to think about, um, you know, what is pressing at your organization, but at the same time, are you bringing somebody in that is creative, um, that can think differently um, about libraries, but also someone that can contribute to what's happening locally, but also can have an impact on what's happening in your broader community and the people that you partner with and can contribute to larger projects. I think more and more when we think about staffing, it's not so much hiring someone to sit in a chair in a certain department, but the expectation that that person will contribute to home projects as well as community efforts and global efforts as well, and that there needs to be an, an accepted norm that that person might not be in the office all the time and that uh, they're working at home. And even though they might be working on a large scale project um, that involves a lot of partners, that that benefit will eventually come back home. Okay, let's, so let's move to, no, you want, you want, you want to say something? Yes, please. I, I just wanted to uh, add one, uh, one point. I, for a long time I ran an IT organization and in an IT organization often it's not about degrees and it's not about, uh, it's even not about experience, it's about what you can do. And it seems to me if we can think about what we need to have done in our institutions and start thinking about that first instead of the, you know, the more formal qualifications, I think that would be the one thing I would look for. Can you do the job that we are asking you to do? So. Okay, thanks. So we can move now to item number four. Um, so Klaus-Peter Budger will talk a little bit about lobbying because lobbying will be very important in the coming years, I think. Yeah, do you think so? Um, no future without lobbying. Uh, may I ask you who has been in contact with your newly elected member of the European Parliament? Oh, well, that's a good rate. Um, they will eventually decide about the future of libraries, perhaps decide about the future of a new copyright for the digital world. So please talk with the politicians, because um, talking about lobbying means talking about politics and talking with politicians. Uh, I'm not going to make a statement on, on lobbying in general, but I uh, want to give you some personal impressions and experiences, especially from a bleeder side in Brussels, and especially with the European Commission and also with the European politicians. Um, I think that no one of us here in this room has had a special training on lobbying. No educational training on that topic. Um, I guess, um, I think that many of us look enviously to those areas who are successful in lobbying despite the bad reputa reputation, uh, for instance, car industry or tobacco or pharmacy or something like that. But I guess that everyone here will agree that it is absolutely necessary to go into the competition with 15,536 registered lobbyists in Brussels on the European level. Of course, not all of them in the field of librarianship, uh, but also research and science organizations or my favorite enemy at the moment, the publishers. Uh, public institution against economic power. Maybe an uneven struggle, but if we don't go into it, we have lost. I think Ablida and Lieber are sitting in the same boat and are quite well rowing in the same direction. We had the pleasure to work together in some of the European licensing for European working groups, and we also had together the pleasure of leaving the working group. For instance, text and data mining to, ex to express our regret 
on the lack of concrete results because other interests were stronger, especially the, the European Commission. So we were not able to sign a common paper and the European Commission was certainly not amused, but um, this is now not our target. My personal view, I think libraries, libraries and librarians have thought for too long time that they are the good ones and public institutions with the public task so not in danger of any legal development. But we have to convince uh, politicians of the necessity, for instance, for further legislation, a legislation looking forward to the digital world. I would like to give you an example with the lobbying and uh, uh, with the um, campaign accompanying lobbying. As Susan Riley um, said some, uh, some minutes before, the, read, the right to read, the read to mine, uh, Eblida says the right to e-read. <clears throat> of course, the European Commission is not amused because they think the market will regulate this difficult legal question. But I think, and we are um, convinced that this is not possible. One experience from certain talks with politicians, what for us is a matter of course, it is not for a politician. He does not know anything about how licensing on e-books work. Well, um, one of them was uh, really surprised that for instance, that's of course especially a public library problem, but it's on the same legal background as for academic libraries, that we are not able to buy any available ebook because we don't get the license. So we have to make politicians also to librarian experts. And, um, well, that's for the moment, I think, uh, that shows that for the next five years of the new European Parliament and then the newly uh, elected commissioner. We have a lot of work to do and we have to do a lot of work together. Not to confuse that there are so many European library organizations but to talk with one European library voice. Thanks. Uh, Eliot, do you, do you share the same views as described by Klaus Peter from the other side of the Atlantic Ocean? Yes, <laughs> but I, I actually had a question, and I've, um, what I've wondered about over the years is that the way that we lobby and the way that we respond is usually, at least in the U.S., by writing letters, signing letters, and sending, sending our voice forward, or individual lobbying of individual um, officers or government officials. There seems to be a worldwide interest in the ability to e-read, openness, um, that everyone should have access to things. Is there a different or better way to do this? Or another way, not, not to abandon the way we do it now, but I was wondering about, and I know this is a more fraught thing in Europe perhaps than in the US, but mobilizing public opinion? Because it seems to me public opinion is on our side, all over the place. So is there a way that we could sort of think about other ways to lobby that use other forms of communication other than written letters and face-to-face -face, uh, kinds of activities. Yeah, you're certainly right. Uh, because uh, that's one of the problems, I think, um, to bridge the gap between, let's say, let's take it, the European problem to, to the librarian in the last branch and their customers and patrons. So we tried with this, with this campaign, for instance, to install um, signature um, uh, stations for the petition. Um, but you have to, to, um, to make clear your patrons what is your problem. And uh, this way, from the European level to the patron, is very, very long. But we have to 
to, to, um, to choose different means than just to write letters. And I can assure you that the uh, European Commission, uh, uh, not the Commissioner, but um, uh, the staff of the um, DG market is not amused by uh, such actions. But that's not uh, to our pleasure here. Yeah. <laughs> And how could uh, associations of librarians help in, in, in that process B between, between the European Commission and, and, uh, and the libraries themselves and the patients? Because the, the, the library associations are not directly in contact with the final users. Uh, those are the libraries who are doing that. So, so how, how can you have a role in between uh, those two levels in, in associations? If I would know the, the ideal answer for that question, I would um, certainly be a, be a step forward. Um, it's, uh, to, it's really important to find information policies, especially in, that, uh, in that these times with social media and so on. Um, but as I said, it's a, it's a very long way. and, and um, if anyone has any advice and to give us, us the real solution, I would, it would be very helpful. It's not a depressive answer, but um, um, we haven't certainly not yet right, found the right way for it. One suggestion that um, has often been given to me about how my organization can help with advocacy is is there some way that you could develop a, you know, a six slide PowerPoint that we can have? You know, we found that if we can unify the voices and, sh and, and help clarify the message, that helps us with the ground roots. You know, it's kind of like, how can we, when we're talking about, somebody said to me the other day, you can't simplify copyright enough. You only have three minutes to tell somebody. So how can we have short animated videos or a, a quick, slide deck that somebody can take with them to a meeting to help communicate what people will lose or what they can gain by a specific issue. And um, I really look to my library organizations to help me communicate that message to my neighbors, my public library, and, and people on the grassroots level because sometimes that um, strategy vision, that, that larger scale message really doesn't resonate with them. So finding ways to really bring it to the common person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And one last thought is, um, and we did this during our strategic thinking and design process, actual stories of actual real things that would actually make the point much more quickly than the legal one. So. Okay, thanks a lot. So let's move to item number five. Since we were living in a worldwide village, uh, we will talk about uh, network information. And, and Chris uh, uh, Clifford Lynch uh, will give a, a, a short vision about that. Okay. Um, so this actually has some very interesting connections to the conversation we just had. Um, I think that you would all agree that um, the kinds of collections, the kinds of materials that research libraries and national libraries are going to need to be responsible for are changing. Uh, one of the themes um, at LIBOR over the last couple of years has been the emergence of research data, for example. And we've seen a lot of taking greater responsibility for um, the outputs of research, be it data or um, publications in the context of open access that are coming out of the research that happens in our institutions. Um, I think that that is now well recognized, uh, although I think it's going to turn out to be more complicated in the long term than we yet realize. For example, um, as I look at what's happening with research data, it's clear that there's going to need to be a coordinated reappraisal process that crosses institutions, national boundaries, and disciplinary boundaries for that collection of data. But um, I think that we need to recognize that not only is the presence of the global network and all of the commerce and new kinds of material and behaviors it enables 
changing what we do in the world of higher education and research, but it's changing the evidence that our next generations of scholars are going to need. We used to collect books. We would collect sound recordings. We would collect um, moving image material. Uh, now, all of that is moving digital, and the traditional uh, commercial frameworks that, for example, produce published books are falling apart. The, the um, frameworks that produced music that we could acquire are falling apart. Um, we can't license music. We talked a little bit about ebooks and the inability for libraries to collect ebooks. We should also recognize there's an enormous increase in self publishing um, that we're going to need to actively reach out for. Um, other parts of the evidence base are changing too. Look at what happened to news. Um, news is an essential um, referent for future um, scholars in many, many fields. Look at what's happening in the use of various kinds of big data um, that are coming out of our social systems. Look at what's happening with social media. Our libraries collectively are going to need to manage that evidence base and make sure it's there for future scholars. Right now, we don't have the legal capabilities to do that. Um, resting on copyright deposit as it's vested in our national libraries is not going to be enough here. The problem is too big and too complex. And we have to start making um, this case and figuring out, I believe, collectively how to do this. This is an amazingly hard problem that is going to, I think, um, fundamentally um, change a lot of what our libraries are doing in the frame in the time frame 2020 to 2030. But um, I think it's it's an area of um, of great obligation to the future of scholarship and understanding of culture. So. Um, I think we need to be very mindful not just of what networks are enabling, but how it's changing the whole um, the, the whole record of society and of uh, culture and art and, and scholarly work that we're going to need to deal with going forward. Maybe you can open the discussion to the room now if you have some questions or some comments on what has been said bring this uh, panel discussion. Just don't forget to present yourself. <clears throat> Erlang Colling Nielsen, the Royal Library, Copenhagen. <clears throat> I think that you all, when you are uh, talking about digital collections in the future and what we are going to do, have a somewhat narrow perspective. You're talking about retro-digitizing material still. Of course, that's a big task, and uh, that we'll never be, <laughs> probably not in our generation, have all our special collections, not even all our book collections, uh, throughout the world, and especially not our archival collections retro-digitized. Then you talk about <clears throat> the raw data and the research data, which is a big issue these days. Uh, of course, that's also relevant, and it's especially relevant to define the limits between what w will be the future uh, tasks of the libraries and what uh, will not be that. Uh, because uh, judging from the past and the present, we cannot take care of all raw dat data uh, through all uh, subject areas. Uh, but you also miss a thing, especially from many European countries' point of view, and especially from the point of view of national libraries. Uh, and I think the United States in, is an exception there because I've never heard uh, you from the university libraries and ARL in uh, the United States talk about uh, the national obligations and the role of the Library of Congress. 
But <clears throat> I refer to an article in the Festschrift for the, uh, the uh, former uh, chief executive of the British Library in Brindley that was published last year in Alexandria about what is a big challenge also to uh, especially uh, national libraries. But I think it's the same in the United States for some university libraries that more or less uh, act as uh, regional or special national libraries. And that is to cope with the present production of digi digitally born materials of all types, because there are, there are even more types than there were in the past, but there are parallels to manuscripts, there are parallels to letters, there are parallels to uh, private archives. There are, what about all the digital, digitally produced photographs? Uh, and uh, within all areas, in, within the traditional uh, library, there are parallel in the present and future of digitally born material that will be lost if we are not dealing with it. And I have seen no one in this conference and uh, in these de debates dealing with that perspective. Uh, it has been the perspective of university libraries, the perspective of university library services to students and researchers and uh, preserving the f future research data. Research, research data, uh, well, from a humanities point of view, research data is much more than what you have discussed here. Uh, so um, what about that? Who is going to take care of that in the future? Who will have the responsibility? And how do we uh, deal with that in, uh, I, in our IT services and, pre uh, and future uh, <coughs> infrastructures? That's big questions. Yeah, you had a lot of questions in there, and I'm going to try to answer some and then look to my fellow panelists to help with the others. Um, you asked about the role of the Library of Congress, and um, I, I think sometimes our international colleagues misunderstand that the Library of Congress is the Library of Congress. They are not our national library. We look to part. They don't have a legal mandate to be our national library. They serve at the benefit of the Library of Congress. Um, they work together with the National Archives as well as our national network to help us in a leadership position. Um, they help us form the National Digital Stewardship Alliance, which is a partnership organization focusing on digital preservation issues. And um, they do provide some leadership in helping us organize, which has been, um, they've been doing some great work um, over the past 15 years in that area. And I'm, the National Digital Stewardship Alliance has a lot of uh, guidance, providing guidance around born digital materials, especially personal archiving. They helped organize um, an annual conference around personal archiving, personal photos, to help people realize the real, um, ephemeral nature, that, uh, that uh, flimsy nature of digital and how to do that personally so that if people have personal archives to donate to libraries in the future that we have some things to work with. There is a lot of work being done around digital, born digital materials within the United States and internationally. You see that around the um, IPRES conference, the joint conference on digital libraries, and um, I want to say it's TCPL, but I think I got that all wrong. They're having a joint meeting in September. Um, and IDCC, the International Data Curation Conference, also helps with that. I think your question about um, can libraries preserve all the research data, the conversations I've been involved with, we acknowledge that that is not possible and that we have to work with, um, I think there was a, Elliot, you had said about curating across, you know, there's gonna have to be that archival, archival process of evaluating what data sets do you keep? And how do we partner with um, folks like our data centers, like uh, the one I was thinking of is in, at Oak Ridge National Labs or out in San Diego, and look at building an infrastructure that involves data centers, our science centers, and our libraries, because um, focusing on data and long-term data and 
When we look at data management plans, people usually only have data management plans around five years. So when is it okay to discard data sets and what do we need to keep? So that, I'm just gonna leave it there and kind of hand the mic down the line. Well, I could, uh, could make a comment too because um, if I hear Anna Colleen Nielsen uh, telling us to save everything that has been uh, on a computer, that is very strange because in old times when everything was on paper, uh, the universities didn't save all the preparatory work for, for, for a thesis or for an article. And at least in my university at Uppsala, uh, we have very few uh, professorial archives uh, from those days. But now suddenly when it has been in zeros and ones, uh, one has to save it. Why? No, but I didn't say that we should either. Okay, I, I'm afraid we, we must put an end to, 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 to a meeting because we got a, 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 an appointment at uh, half past six uh, downtown, so if people want to go to the hotel and, and, and then be fresh for tonight's event, uh, we need to stop. So I, I would like you to, to uh, thank to, uh, all, the pa um, all the panelists for this uh, ta round table. So may we applaud them? Yeah, thanks. Okay. And see you in 35 minutes downtown uh, at the Minor Guild or something like that, I guess. Thanks.